Although the structural features of the muscle fibers are different in skeletal and cardiac muscle, the sarcomeres are the same. Indeed, both skeletal and cardiac muscle are striated because their sarcomeres have exactly the same arrangement and work exactly the same way. The striations are due to the regular arrangement of actin and myosin in the fibrils, which is true of cardiac and skeletal muscle. They have a well-developed sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is also true of cardiac and skeletal muscle. They have T-tubules that surround each myofibril, also true of cardiac and skeletal muscle. The binding sites of actin are covered by tropomyosin, true in cardiac and true in skeletal muscle. And finally, contraction is initiated by the release of calcium, which is true in both types of muscle as well. There are, however, two other important differences between cardiac and skeletal muscle. And the first is the shape of the action potential. The action potentials generated by cardiac muscle fibers are much longer than those generated by skeletal muscle fibers. In skeletal muscle, the action potentials are very short, on the order of about 1 1 millisecond. Cardiac muscle fibers, in contrast, generate action potentials that last about 200 milliseconds. The long duration of the cardiac action potential ensures that the fibers will not twitch, but rather contract strongly and will remain contracted for a sufficient period to expel blood from the atria into the ventricles and from the ventricles into the lungs and throughout the body. The second difference is in the way that calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. There are two main features that account for the different ways that calcium is released in cardiac muscle. The first is the difference in the dihydropyridine receptors, the voltage-gated calcium channels embedded in the membrane of the transverse tubules. The second is the way in which the channels of the ryanodine receptors are opened to allow calcium to flow from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the sarcoplasm, thereby initiating contraction. To highlight these differences, let's first recall how dihydropyridine receptors and ryanodine receptors work in skeletal muscle fibers. In skeletal muscle fibers, the dihydropyridine receptors are mechanically coupled to the ryanodine receptors. When the fiber is depolarized by an action potential, the dihydropyridine receptors do not open a channel to allow calcium to enter the sarcoplasm from the extracellular fluid. Rather, the gates of the dihydropyridine receptors open and they mechanically remove the plug from the ryanodine receptors, thereby opening the ryanodine channels, which allows calcium to flow out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and initiate contraction of the sarcomeres. Since there is a large depolarization caused by the invasion of an action potential into a transverse tubule, the gates on most, if not all, the dihydropyridine receptors are moved thereby opening most or all of the calcium channels on the ryanodine receptors. This in turn allows for a sufficiently large influx of calcium into the sarcoplasm so that the sarcomeres shorten maximally. Each action potential is so short in skeletal muscle that the period of sarcomere shortening is too short to fully stretch the elastic components, thereby only causing the muscle to twitch. <clears throat> In cardiac muscle, the dihydropyridine receptors are voltage-gated calcium channels, in that they have a gate that is opened by depolarization, and when it's opened, it allows calcium to flow through the open channel. Some of these gates, however, are a bit different in that they have two gates, and these are the channels that are shown here. One of the gates 
is open by voltage. It's voltage gated. The second gate is closed and cannot be opened by voltage. That gate is only opened when the channel is phosphorylated. When these channels are not phosphorylated, they are unavailable. That is, even though the voltage-sensitive gate opens with depolarization, calcium cannot flow through the channel because it is blocked by the non-voltage-gated channel. These channels are phosphorylated by the action of a metabotropic adrenergic receptors, receptors that bind adrenaline and activate a G protein that ultimately causes the phosphorylation of the channel. When the channel is phosphorylated, the non-voltage sensitive gate is opened and the channel becomes available to conduct calcium when the membrane depolarizes. The ryanodine receptors in cardiac muscle are not coupled to the dihydropyridine receptors the way they are in skeletal muscle. Rather, the channels are ligand-gated, and the ligand is calcium. In other words, the binding of calcium opens the receptors. Thus, binding calcium activates the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The more calcium there is in the sarcoplasm, the more that binds to the reanodine receptors, and thus more calcium is released into the sarcoplasm. Now, let's put the entire picture together. Here, there is a basal number of phosphorylated calcium channels. Only two are shown. One is unavailable because it is not phosphorylated, while the other is phosphorylated and is available. A cardiac action potential then sweeps down the transverse tubule and opens the available calcium channel. The small influx of calcium then opens one of the ryanodine receptors, causing a small amount of calcium to flow into the sarcoplasm and initiates sarcomere shortening. Notice that the sarcomeres do not undergo maximal shortening because of the relatively small amount of calcium. A moment later, the cell repolarizes, closing the calcium channels. The calcium in the sarcoplasm is then pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and the muscle relaxes. Now, additional adrenaline is present and activates metabotropic adrenergic receptors, which in turn phosphorylates additional calcium channels, making them available. Now an action potential causes a larger influx of calcium. That in turn opens more ryanodine receptors, which then leads to more calcium released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The enhanced amount of calcium in the sarcoplasm then allows the sarcomeres to shorten maximally. The cell then repolarizes. The calcium is pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and the sarcomere relaxes. These features of the dihydropyridine receptors and the ryanodine receptors allow cardiac muscle to achieve various states of contractile force. And this also explains why the adrenaline released by the sympathetic nervous system causes a more forceful contraction of the heart, which in turn raises blood pressure. Finally, the entire sequence of contractions in the atria and ventricles is orchestrated by the SA and AV nodes together with the bundle of Hiss. The sequence begins with the action potentials generated autorhythmically in the SA node. The currents generated by those action potentials then spread to the atrial fibers via the electrical synapses made by gap junctions. Since the atrial fibers are also electrically connected, the action potential spread from one atrial fiber to the next. This is also shown in this slide. Once the action potentials in the atria reach the AV node, they evoke action potentials in the node, which then propagate along the bundle of Hiss 
to activate the ventricular musculature. I should add that the bundle of Hiss is composed of fibers called Purkinje fibers that have very rapid conduction velocities. The Purkinje fibers in the bundle of Hiss make electrical synapses via gap junctions with each ventricular fiber and thereby simultaneously excite all of the ventricular fibers. As shown in the figure on the right, the currents generated by the action potentials in the Purkinje fibers pass through the gap junctions and evoke cardiac action potentials in each ventricular muscle fiber, thereby causing the ventricles to contract strongly and synchronously. It is the strong synchronous contractions that provide the muscular force that pumps blood under high pressure throughout the entire body.